Welcome to Reason for Truth. I'm your host, Stevie Garofalo. Reason for Truth, where the truth comes first and the reasons come last, but where we're always in constantly learning. Because listen, we stop learning, we stop teaching. We at least stop teaching well. Today, we have a special presentation by my counterpart here, speaker at Reason for Truth, Del Potter. Went to school with Del at Southern Evangelical Seminary. And today, Del is going to, uh, we're going to look at part one of a two-part series Dell did on the apologist first responder or the first responder apologist. Dell's going to talk us to us about the the importance of apologetics and really as first responder. I hope you enjoy it. This is part one. Listen, little tip: make sure you subscribe. That way, you won't miss part two or any of the other ones. So, God's blessings to you. Hope this uh, equips you. Hope this blesses you. And now, get ready for Dell Potter for first responder apologist. Uh, my name is Dell Potter. I'm a graduate of SES. Uh, seminary and I have my uh, master's in apologetics with a specialized emphasis in early Christianity. And uh, I graduated three years ago and uh, it's been an incredible experience. I encourage you just to, if, if at all, if you don't have time, the money, uh, just to come in and do an audit for, for some of the classes. Great professors, um, down to earth, and uh, it's all about defending the word of God, not our words. Like Romans 3, 4 says, may, be, may, may God be found true and every man a liar. Speaking of professors, um, I was able to take a class, a couple classes with Dr. Richard Howe. Um, maybe some of you have already listened to one of his presentations. In fact, he's doing one right now called, How Do You Know That You Know? You know? And uh, anyway, I took one of his classes called Apologetic Systems. And it was interesting because we learned a little different facets of different world systems out there, what they believe, obviously. And uh, I'll never forget what Dr. Howe said in one of our sessions. He said that, you know, witnessing and using apologetics to other world-based systems is kind of like coming upon the scene of, a, of, of an accident uh, and somebody's on the ground and if anybody even know dr howe you know what he does he uses his big words you have to have a dictionary for to understand what he's saying smart guy but um he said you come across this guy on the ground he's extenuating which means he's bleeding heavily on the ground and and, and what do you do do you come up to him and say you idiot what are you doing on the ground you should have gone up here why are you here no, what do you do? You come up on somebody who's like that. You say, are you okay? How can I help? And you try to give them the best comfort as possible. And you try to lead them to somebody like a first responder, a medical attention that can get them to where they're going. And then what he said was, is after you do that, they get in the hospital bed and they're on the mend. Then you start asking them a little more questions about what happened, what brought you to this place and time and all that. Um, and you get them on the mend and then you start slowly getting some questions now what happens. Well, that's kind of interesting. That's kind of what we are supposed to be as first responder apologists, or even just Christians who love Jesus Christ and love his word. How do we go about doing that in a world full of just uh, ideologies and that are violent uh, toward our Christian belief and, and be able to do that with love and respect? Well, that's what we're going to do here today. Uh, we're going to talk about that. But, but first, I'm going to share my screen with you if you don't mind. I hope it's going to be a, come out okay. Um, I tried to work this out before we started. Um, can you all see that okay? You should see it on your screen here. I apologize for first responder. Um, my wife and I, we work for FedEx. We work for government services. And a few years ago, we came upon an accident. And I'm going to share this with you right here. Um, there it is. Um, it wasn't this exact accident, um, but it was basically the same kind of accident. It was at nighttime. My wife and I were going to Southern California. And uh, we came upon this accident in the middle of the night, and there were no lights on. Power must have gone out. A storm hit there, and uh, there was this accident we came upon that looked similar like this. A few bodies on the ground. I was the first one there. Um, here I am just driving, and, and I stopped, and all I just knew was my basic instincts was to stop, get out, and see if everybody was okay. So I stopped the truck and pulled it off to where nobody would you know, hit it because it was dark outside. So I put my flashers on. And I went to the first person I saw, and they were moaning. And I, and I just said, sir, it's, okay. it's going to be okay. You're going to be just fine. Just don't move. And I remember one of the people that came after me came on there and was trying to move the, the, the victim. And I said, listen, don't, don't try to move him. Just leave him still, um, and we're going to call 911 and let somebody come. And so that's what I did. I called 911. Just within minutes, um, the first responders came up. But, you know, I didn't go up there and start asking questions. I just said, I just wanted to reassure them that, hey, everything's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. We're going to get the medical attention you need. And I look at kind of like that as that, that's what we're supposed to do as a, as a first responder. Christians are apologists.
psychologists or ministers or what have you, is that when we see people we come upon in our lives, and they may have different garb on, religious garb, um, um, I call them grave clothes, um, but wherever they're at, where they are in their life, um, whether we agree with them or not, uh, what James says in James 3, he says that we sit there, we bless God, but we would curse man who's created in the image of God. So I'm going to share with you a profound story uh, from, the, from the accident. Uh, it's from the Bible. Are you, from, are you probably familiar with it? Luke 10. Um, Jesus gives us this wonderful story in the Gospel of Luke on what it means to be a first responder, not just for physically. I, I gave a physical representation of that but what it means to be a first responder spiritually. And it's in Luke 10. I'm not going to go through it all with you because of time. Um, but um, I'll go to the next slide here. <clears throat> Here's a story of the, the picture of the Good Samaritan. I'm going to just give you the gist of it, okay? Um, a lawyer wanting to test Jesus. Let me back up here. A lawyer wanting to test Jesus has just asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, just kind of context here. This is not just any lawyer. This is not a lawyer, a criminal lawyer. This is a lawyer of the law. He is a Jewish apologist for the Torah. And he comes and asks Jesus, hey, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You couldn't ask a better question to the best person for it who can actually do something about it, right? And that's in verse 25 of Luke 10. Jesus responds with, what is written in the law? What do you read them? How do you read them? The lawyer answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. That's 27. Jesus responds, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. What's amazing is Jesus just gave this a, a Torah apologist, right? He gave him Deuteronomy 6, 3, and 4 and Leviticus 19 and 18. And he says, these two laws, you do these together. He then quotes again from Leviticus and says, if you do these two laws, you'll live. That's pretty incredible uh, because uh, Jesus says in Matthew 22, he says, listen, they asked him, well, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, the greatest commandment is this, love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. The second one is right there. He says, this ends the law and the prophets. It's amazing here is because Jesus is giving this man an answer to a question about eternal life. And he's saying, if you want eternal life, then you keep these two commandments, and this will be the end of the law and the prophets. The lawyer now, at this point, the lawyer should have said, you know what, um, I can't do that. I can't love God completely and fully. I just can't do that. He skips the loving your neighbor yourself, right? And he says, however, the lawyer apparently wants to justify himself. And so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I mean, it's amazing. He just leapfrogs loving God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. And he goes right to the neighbor. Why did he do that? Because in his mind, he can love God perfectly. But what you need, what you need to do, Jesus, now is you need to define who my neighbor is because um, I have a lot of neighbors and I don't agree with them and I don't like them. And so Jesus tells us this incredible story. And I don't want to go into it because you know about it. It's the Good Samaritan. Um, but I'll just to kind of give you a little highlight something from the story that you probably will know. A uh, man was going down from, uh, from, uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was hit by robbers. Now, these robbers not just beat the guy, they left him for half dead, right? And Jesus says there were two priests that came by. What's interesting in the Greek is that he uses the word verb anti. Not only did he just go by the man, the, the good Samaritan, they went opposite direction. Um, this is saying that these two men saw the Samaritan and saw him for who he was and said, I don't have anything to do with it. And they went the other direction. What essentially Jesus is saying, these two men didn't have a love for their neighbor or a love for God because the lawyer should have known, right? That Leviticus, uh, Exodus 23 says that even your ox gets, you know, donkey gets stuck in the ditch. You should get it out. And even Leviticus 19 I just sort of thought about this, Leviticus 19, where it says that you should love your neighbor as yourself. In the same chapter, it says you should love your stranger and help them. The lawyer should have understood and knew that. But again, because he didn't have a love for his fellow man, Jesus kind of chastises him, not chastises him, kind of puts him in his place. The whole point of apologetics is you separate the questioner from the question. 
which means we don't attack the questioner. We don't, if you're on the ground, they have a false worldview and they're on the ground bleeding. We don't sit there and kick them and make it worse. We find out why they think the way they do. And we separate the questioner from the question. And that's what Jesus does here in Luke 10. He separates the lawyer, the questioner from his question, and he turns it on the side of his head. And he tells the lawyer, he says, he says, which when he tells the story of the, the Good Samaritan and the Good Samaritan comes and helps this man and helps him to um, get some on his back, heals his wounds, gives him two denarii, which probably equivalent today would be two months worth of ho hotel rent. Uh, that's amazing right there. But he makes the Samaritan the hero of the story. Think about this. The Samaritan was hated by the Jews. Remember back now in the captivity, when after 70 years, um, after the expersion, people went back to the home. A lot of Jews didn't go back. They stayed in Babylon because they had families and probably work and all that. Well, they started intermarrying, and so they became half-breed. They became Samaritans through all that. Well, they, when they came back, the Jews rejected them. In fact, I think that they even destroyed their temple in 28 BC, I believe. So the Jews did not like the Samaritans. So for Jesus to give this incredible first responder story, to let this lawyer know, you know who your neighbor is? Is the one who you're neighborly to. Doesn't matter where they're from, what walk of life they are, what they think or what they believe. We are all created in the image of God. And we're supposed to love our neighbor as ourself. See, when we love our neighbor as ourselves, we don't love them with the, with the love that we have. Why? Because our when our love ends, something else has to begin. Because if we only love so much, there has to be something there to pick up the slack of that, right? So that's why we have to love God with all our heart, mind, body, and soul, because he gives us this, this love, this compassion for people to be able to love them from where they're at and separate the problems they're having, the problems they're having with the solution that they absolutely need. I kind of go on a little bit about that, um, but I think it's really important. Um, and I tell you why. Um, there's three things that we as a Christian apologist um, should really do. And there are three things I'm going to talk about today. We should examine quickly. Remember I told you about the story about the um, when I came upon this accident? Um, I had to examine everything quickly to find out what was going on to, to, to make sure uh, these people on the ground were safe. The Good Samaritan had to examine quickly this man because he was half dead. He was dying. He had to hurry up and diagnose what this man needed, right? Well, that's the first one, examine quickly. And then we need to hold fast. Well, hold fast to what? Well, obviously... Titus 1, 9 and, and, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 and 22 talk about holding fast to, to God's word. We're supposed to hold fast to the teaching so that when somebody comes against us who is hurting, we can hold fast and be able to give them a, a peace and hope that we have that's within us, an account that's within us, that's with the word of God. And the third final thing, we're going to talk about how we should respond rapidly. Um, if, if we examine everything, we know what we're examining, we know what we're doing, and then we hold fast to what is true, we should be able to respond quickly. Why is that? Because we have the tools that we need, as 2 Timothy 2.15 says, to be a workman who is not ashamed of the gospel, but one who rightly handles the truth. In the Greek, it's saying, cut it straight. Uh, that means we cut it straight. We tell people exactly what they need to hear, not what they want to hear, to give them hope. Um, I'm going to address all these questions here later because um, I'm, I'm looking at the right pane here. Um, but just hold on for a minute and we'll cut off early and we'll kick some Q&A. Is that fair? Okay, very good. Let's continue on. The first one is uh, Daki Matsu. That's where we get to examine quickly. Well, what in the world is Daki Matsu? Well, the Daki Matsu is a Greek word that talks about how you should test everything, examine everything as if metals, um, meaning, meaning um, gold or silver. Um, it's interesting to note that... Um, Cop, uh, copper and gold are quite similar in some areas. Um, but there are differencing factors that you can differentiate between fake gold and true gold. One of them is like a water test. Um, gold is much denser than much, most metals, so it'll sink to the bottom, where some of the fake gold will kind of float. Um, another test is tarnish. You can, you can sit there and scratch something or, 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 um, or after time, uh, copper will tarnish where gold will not. Um, uh, you, copper cannot be found pure in nature. Gold is. So there's certain elements there that make gold pure in its sense and uh, where it doesn't wear out 
It keeps, it retains its intrinsic value and it doesn't scar. Um, so that's what we're supposed to do. We come upon somebody, we examine, and some of the things we do examine is we ask questions. Well, why do you think that way? Um, you, you say um, there's no, um, those, no, there's no objective moral value. Um, what led you to, th to say that? Uh, what makes you think there's no objective moral value? Because when you say there's no objective moral value, you're replacing that you yourself have the moral value to justify everybody else's value. But we ask questions first and we find out, we examine. And, and one of the things that we do that is we ask questions and we, and we separate the person, the questioner from those, from the questions. So we decipher both of them. So one, we keep the integrity of the questioner and love them as our, as our neighbors, as ourselves. But then we attack the question to show its unreliability and the fact that the question is not really a valid question. It's based upon a worldview. Um, let me go to the next slide here. Oh, sorry. Okay. This thing is really touchy. I apologize. Um, this is a quote from an early Christian, um, um, Octavius, from Octavius, Mark Messinius and Felix. Uh, probably just around the, around the turn of third turn of the third century. Um, this is amazing what he says, because he was a pagan. He was a lawyer, a pagan lawyer in Rome, and he turned Christian. And this is what he says about the truth. It's important that we carefully weigh everything that's said so that we approve and adopt only the things that are true. For there are two sides to every argument, and truth is sometimes hard to discern. Furthermore, the abundance of words can sometimes appear to be solid proof, but really isn't. Well, what, what Octavia, you can read it for yourself and see what he was saying here is that we need to be, we need to discern and to do that, we need to examine and rightly handle uh, the truth and, and ask questions. And, and above all, listen, um, I work with prison ministries. And one of the things that our, our motto is, is that we listen, listen, love, love. Uh, main thing is that we want to exercise uh, to understand, not to be understood so much. Um, and when we come upon people who are hurting who have a false worldview or dying, we know they're spiritually dying, that we're, we know that what the word of God says and they're false. Well, what do we do? Well, we examine, we, we study, we, and, then when, and, then we, and then what we do is we hold fast to the truth that uh, we've been given. Before I go any further, <clears throat> we, only, we also test other people and what they say. Paul also says to the Corinthian church, we need to test ourselves. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you unless you deed fail the test? Sometimes in, in life, we have to fail to succeed. Some of the greatest failures in my life have produced some of the greatest successes. Uh, some of the times I've been dropped into water uh, in life and problems that I've come up with have really tested my spiritual buoyancy to see, hey, do I sink to the bottom because I have density? I, I have uh, purity in my life. Or am I buoyant and just going around the sea of life, just floating around because I have no solid, basically, worldview to go by? Uh, so first of all, we examine, but we also have to examine ourselves. So I think 1 Peter 3.15 says that um, sanctify Christ as Lord of your hearts. Brett right there suggests before we give a defense for anything we have, we have to be sanctified, set apart, which means we've been examined by the Lord and we've examined ourselves to, to find ourselves true and pure as gold or silver. Uh, in front of the Lord so that we can give a defense. And then when we give a defense, we give it uh, as an account for the hope that's within us with gentleness and respect. So first of all, as first responder apologists, we first have to test ourselves, examine ourselves where we're at first. And then we hold fast and we defend. That's where we're on the next part we're going to come in is holding fast. That means defending the truth. That means, that means holding true to the word of God and not being um, having unfiltered, an unapologetic perspective because we're going straight to the word of God so that we can give uh, 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 an answer with compassion and clarity. Why? Because we love God with all our heart, mind, body, and soul. And through that, we can love our neighbor through ourselves by speaking to them the way we would like to be spoken to. Um, I think it's no accident, if you all remember in Revelations 3 and 4, G Jesus has John write seven letters to seven churches, right? And is it interesting? There's only two churches that Jesus had nothing bad to say. You know what those two churches were? Smyrna and Philadelphia. Why Smyrna and Philadelphia? Smyrna was persecuted because why? They loved God with all their heart, mind, body, and soul. 
the Philadelphia church loved their neighbor as yourselves. So between the two churches, they fulfilled the whole law. That's exactly where Jesus is trying to take that lawyer. Hey, listen, you want to be religious? You want to go to church? I tell you what, then if you want to do all that, then, then fine. Then you complete and fulfill the whole law by loving God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and loving your neighbor as yourself. So that wherever you are in life and you come across somebody that, that needs a kind word, um, a biblical word, uh, a sincere word, and somebody who wants to just be genuine, real, and just be there to listen and to be able to answer their questions without attacking the questioner. Um, that's what we need to do. Um, again, hey, thank you so much for this. Well, I'll get to you, uh, Chai Ching. Uh, that's a good question. I'll get with you at the end of okay. So save your questions for me because we're going to do a Q and A here uh, in, in about twenty minutes. Okay, I'm going to save ten minutes for the end. So just hang tight there because I love questions. Believe me, I love questions. Um, um, here's where we go. The second part is that this is where we hold fast. Hold fast to what, right? Well, in the Bible, Titus 1.9 and 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, 22, it's talking about holding fast to the word, to the teaching, which is good, right? Um, how do we apply that now to holding fast when we see other people and talk to other people? Well, um, there's two words there. Keta echo, and the other word is anteki omahi or antekomai. Both of them are hold, but it's interesting. The two words are differentiating. One means hold fast, like hold down, in a good way, where we hold down. We don't let things get away from us. That's a keta echo. And the other one is to hold back, as if to keep at bay. Um, here's a kind of example I gave. Um, Y'all see this movie before? It's called uh, Infinity Wars. Remember this part where um, Captain America kind of holds back Thanos, even though by all intents and purposes, nobody can hold back this guy because he's so strong. But for some reason, Captain America was able to. Well, it was, it was a big thing on the Internet. And um, I think one of the things that they led to believe was that the reason why Captain America was able to do that, because he had a strong will and desire to protect the innocent, to hold fast. And I think that's a wonderful depiction of how we should be, is that when we come, we were we, we confronted with a worldview and opposes us, it's kind of more kind of hostile. We don't try not to attack them, but we attack them with, with the word of God. And and not and here's why I always tell people in the prison, we don't sit there and uh, pass judgment, we proclaim the judgment. And in order to proclaim the judgment, we hold fast to the teachings. We don't compromise, we don't waver, uh, we hold fast to that which is fleeting. Um, so we're kind of like Captain America where he's trying to save, uh, save the, uh, from, from the other Finney Stones being captured, and he's holding back Thanos. And if you don't like that example, I guess there's another example you can be where if you're, if you're in football, I, mean, I play football, and you're running the football, okay, that football is the truth. And you have to get to the goal line. And to be able to thwart off your tacklers, you have to stiff arm them, stiff arm them and hold them back. So maybe that can be another example of what we're talking about, about holding fast, about keeping people back and, and making sure we stand true and hold fast to the faith. Um, but here's the question. Was the teaching that the Bible talks about from the very beginning, the Didache in Greek, taught from the very beginning? This is where we have to actually go in now. We examine everything. We examine the worldview. We hold fast because we know that what did Paul say in Galatians? If I or an angel come preaching another gospel that we've already preached, let them be anathema, accursed. So Paul's saying, listen, we have a teaching here that was right from the very beginning, and we need to hold fast to that. So the next question is, is that when we get confronted, how are we to be able to respond to that? Because there's a lot of people out there that say, well, you know, the Bible is corrupted. <clears throat> the Bible is not the way it was now. Um, it was tainted. It was changed. It was, you know, added to over time. Um, um, there is no God. Nature and sciences have have debunked it, um, things like that. So this is where we as believers, as apologists, Christians, um, say, you know what, we need to respond quickly uh, to this charge because we've examined everything and we're holding fast. So let's move on now to the third one to uh, respond quickly. And, and Thank you for tuning in for part one of the Bedell Potter's talk on uh, first responder apologists. Make sure you do a few things if you're listening on uh, iTunes or on podcasts. Make sure you give this a like. Maybe perhaps consider a five-star review on iTunes. Also, make sure if you're watching on YouTube, you do a few things. Number one, tell all your friends about us. And also, 
give us uh, you know give us thumbs up. But most importantly, what you really want you to do is go ahead, hit the subscribe button. You know I always say that, and that boom, little Sicilian hook there, man. That little bell down there, that little thing's called the alert bell. See, it alerts you of your subscription. Appreciate you tuning in. I hope you got a lot out of today's talk by Dell. This is only part one. Tune in next episode for part two. Listen, Dell's telling us as apologists, and as believers, we, we're all to be apologists on some level. And as in a broken world of hurting people, we are apologists, first responders. Take it from Dell. Take it most importantly from the Word of God. I'm your host, Stephen Garofalo, and this is your reason for truth for today.